One second. For goodness sake, you wouldn't believe, I've just been talking to myself for the last five minutes, believing that I was live and I hadn't pressed the go live button. <laughs> and I was all waxing lyrical about, oh yes, I'm live and I'm early uh, and feeling really good about myself. <laughs> the streaming software <laughs> has got me once again. So I'm hoping that I'm live now. Please just send me a confirmation about the audio and the visuals so I know that you're catching me. Because I was talking to you and I was asking you guys questions and I know that the chat's normally really quick and responsive and I wasn't getting any response. And I was like, what's going on? Why aren't I getting any response? <laughs> oh, gosh. But I think I'm live now. Let me know. Just give me a check for audio and visuals so I know that I'm good. And once again, know that I'm not talking to myself because the only reason I knew in the end that I was actually talking to myself was because I wasn't getting a response. <laughs> so, yeah, that was incredibly goofy of me. But I think I'm live now. But you need to let me know that I'm live. So let me know that. Audio's good, visual's good. Sounds good, all good. Thank you, thank you. Fire, fire fle. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go over some of the things I said a moment ago. Excuse me, bear with me one moment. Yep, yeah, I'm gonna go over some of the things that I said before. <laughs> And first of all, I want to um, welcome Yehuda, who said it's your first live. You're very, very welcome. It's fantastic to have you here. Um, I'd already said this before, but obviously no one heard it because I was talking to myself. Um, and I also want to say a big thank you to the people who are regularly live, not just live, but just kind of supporting on the channel, in the comments, have been there for the start. I really do wholly appreciate each and every one of you. It's fantastic to have you here right now. Um, I want to get straight into this because this isn't going to be the longest live stream. But I think one of the things that I said in the previous video is this format of videos I'm doing now is called Unveiled. And essentially the format allows me to present my latest reconstructions. And I'm trialing this format. This is part two, obviously. And I'm trialing this format as a means of me, first of all, getting more reconstructions out more regularly and secondly not having to do that process of recording a, a video for each of my reconstructions I think it's going to make me more productive um, but I also just like the element of being able to engage with the community um, I enjoy live streams so I find them a little bit more motivating I kind of look forward to doing live streams with you guys as opposed to sitting down in front of the camera and recording something which I don't really look forward to um hence more i'm leaning more and more towards documentaries these days um because i just um yeah like, i like the uh, i just prefer doing them um fantastic everyone can hear me also i just want to show you something really quickly because obviously i get i'm still working my way around this software i've pinned talia's comment at the top and i've done that just to show that i can pin kind of show pinned comments and the idea behind this is if people do, um, you know, contribute something via the Super Chat, who I obviously take priority to respond to straight away, I can now show their comment. So that took me a little while to get there. So I'm quite happy with that little, little development. <laughs> you have to understand it's baby steps, really. Oh, God. Wow. See, that comes up straight away just to kind of kill what I'm doing. Go away. Um <laughs> So, yeah, that's a little development that I'm happy with. But, yeah, without further ado, I would like to kind of start to dive in to some of the content, okay? Um, also, I just want to kind of show you my Exiled Egyptians t-shirt and my Exiled Egyptians mug. I actually made a bit... I'm not sure if I made this joke before or after, but I am drinking tea at the moment. I'm genuinely drinking tea. I drink tea about three times a day. So if any of you had any, you know, any of you were wondering about how English I actually am, um, that kind of answers your question. <laughs> it's a real thing out here. It's not just a rumour about English people drinking tea. I drink tea so much, I can't help it. One of my greatest fears right now is actually this cup of tea getting cold during a live stream, which is inevitably going to happen. Um, but yeah, there you go. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we've got a few people in now. So I think at this stage, I'm going to dive straight in. I really do appreciate everyone coming. Um... Yeah, let's let's get into this. So basically, you would have seen from the title of the video, 
um, that today I'm going to be unveiling a reconstruction of Amos Nefertari. Now, I want you to really stick around for this because one of the reasons I'm doing this reconstruction, I was I had kind of decided that I was going to cluster my reconstructions together and, you know, show two or three per video. But this one, I've given its own video and you're going to see why in a moment because the process I took to get to this reconstruction actually has been in the making for something like 12 years. And I know that sounds really, really strange, but I'm going to explain a little bit more when I get there. But it's been in the making for a long time. And actually the process that I took to get to the reconstruction and the final result, I'm I, I'm really, really in love with this reconstruction that I've produced here. Um, I hope you feel as you know passionate and as taken by the reconstruction when I show you it as as I was when I created it. And I've wanted to do Amos Nefertari for so long. Um, so actually being able to cross that milestone um, has, you know, it was a massive thing for me. So before I dive straight in and start showing you um, Amos Nefertari, I'm going to do a little bit of a digest. So we're gonna have a look at some of the stuff that we looked at the previous unveiled and just kind of have a little bit of a review. Um, and also bring you into some of the plans that I've got around them. So on the screen right now, um, I'll try and get to the comments soon. Um, yeah, so yeah, I will try. And you know I can't get to all of them, but obviously if you want me to read it out straight away, just um, put a super chat in. I'm going to just change my screen quickly. And I'm going to start with Horror Maquette or the, the Sphinx. Okay. Um, I know it's... That's the Sphinx is not its proper name, but, you know, I have to <laughs> give, give it a name that everyone kind of also knows what I mean when I'm when I'm when I'm, when I'm talking about it. So I know um, Horror Mac here means Hero on the Horizon, but I was really pleased with this reconstruction. And actually, right now I'm in the process of creating a short about the entire process behind creating this reconstruction of the Sphinx. Um, and it's really interesting because obviously it's starting as a, a short, as I say all the time, I start with a short and then in the end I start compiling it and I start drafting, I start putting together and in the end I end up with so much content that it ends up being a long video. Um, Sankum, thank you so much for your donation. I really appreciate it. Let me just, uh, can I unpin, I think I have to unpin the top one. Bear with me. So if I do that, um, it's still not letting me pin it. I think because you haven't put a comment, I can't pin it, which is a shame. I would like to have pinned it. So thank you very much, Sankum, for your donation of five pounds. I really, really appreciate it. I can't pin it. I think because you haven't written a comment, I'd like to display it on the screen. I'm trying to, I'm trying to show this new tech that I've got going at the moment. Um, so anyway, it's really interesting. I'm going to put most of this in the short, but basically one of the people mentioned, and I think I mentioned in the last video as well, about the um, the Denon sketch, which was one of the first sketches of the Sphinx in recent times. So I'm going to just put on the screen the Denon sketch now so you can all kind of have a look at it. If I can find it, here it is. And this was one of the kind of resources that I used so in terms of the Sphinx's Africanicity, there was certainly no doubt about the ethnicity of the Sphinx. And actually there are several quotes from the earliest sojourners into ancient Egypt about the fact that this was the face of an, an African. Essentially, it was undeniable, had very thick and broad lips. And Obviously, they had no reason to present the Sphinx like this unless they, you know, unless they actually look like that. So, you know, um, this was one of the motivations. So you can see in terms of the way and actually there's another image as well. I think I shared with you last time. So this is the image I shared last time of an early 19th century photograph. And you can see there how the lips are really and truly very much, I, I would even say my reconstruction, I may have understated the broadness of the lips somewhat. Thank you very much, Crenshaw Grinder. I really appreciate, wow, $20. That's a really generous, it's not let me pin. Why won't it let me pin? Okay, I'm gonna have to figure this thing out. 
This is very embarrassing. I thought it would just let me pin, and then if it lets me pin, then I can highlight it. This is not working as I had hoped. So it lets me pin comments, but not super chats. That's bizarre, isn't it? Oh dear. Okay, so I have to now correct myself because what I said before was a little bit of false news. I was hoping <laughs> for the life of me that I was going to be able to um, pin the um, super chat spot. I don't think I've got that method worked out. So sorry if anyone's waiting for their super chat to be pinned, which you obviously do deserve. Um, I, you know, I'm, I do apologize. <laughs> Hope you can forgive me for that one. But anyway, um, and Black Rampage, salute, salute to you too, sir. I really appreciate the 499 um, donation. You guys are the best. So, yeah, when I made this reconstruction, you can see now that obviously there's very little in terms of exaggeration taking place here. I think this is spot on. And I did also mention the subnasal prognathism, i.e. the, in fact, let me just show you the original really quickly. The prognathism exhibited is something that I've only seen in the people of South Sudan. And that is one of the reasons why when it came to my um, reconstruction, I used kind of the South Sudanese phenotype as the reference point, because I thought it was the one that was going to portray the face as truly as possible. Now, a lot of people do, there is the kind of widespread kind of belief slash understanding that this was supposed to be in Caffrey's likeness because they found a bunch of Caffrey statues inside one of the chambers of the Sphinx. However, this has kind of been, you can discredit this essentially because Caffrey just doesn't have the features on this Sphinx, doesn't have the subnasal prognathism. He does have some, but it's not to the extent of the Sphinx and essentially facially it doesn't match. And actually the earliest descriptions used to describe this as being a female, a woman, so, you know, it's just some interesting things there. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm really pleased with the, the final result. The other one that we discussed, or that I, yeah, on the video, or we unveiled, I should say, was Queen T. Now, I've actually updated Queen T since then. So those of you who are members, um, or who are kind of regulars on the channel, this was the Queen T that I showed. So let me just quickly show it here. So this is the Queen T that I unveiled. And as you can imagine, I, I was really pleased with this. But I think some people rightly pointed out that she looks a bit young, which <sighs> I'm kind of two ways about because someone did point out to me, and I don't mean this any offensive way if you're not a part of the club, but someone pointed out to me, black don't crack. So this could be a 25 year old, or it could just be a 45 year old that's really taking care of herself, which is actually very, very true. Let's be totally honest with you. Um, some of you would be shocked to learn my age or the, the age of my wife <laughs> um, we look really young um, and I'm not saying that to boast but I'm just saying that because it's just you know the nature of you know if you're melanated and you you look after yourself you do have the benefit of being able to preserve your youth for some for some time however I did want to bring some of that kind of wisdomous age back into this creation. So I, what I actually did was, I don't know if many of you remember my original tea, but I'm just gonna quickly show you my original queen tea that I did. So this was my original queen tea. And I was obviously very pleased with it at the time. So this is my original queen tea. And what I said to, said to myself is, I can bring some of these elements in, because I think age wise, and kind of just look wise, I'd got this one spot on. But in terms of the features, I feel that obviously the new one I feel is much stronger. So what I did is I just basically blended some of the elements and wasn't sure what the outcome would be. But the outcome, although a subtle change from the new one, I was, something about it just really struck me. So this was the final outcome of my Queen T, my new Queen T. And this is kind of where I'm at at the moment with Queen T. And I almost, I'm tempted to say, I might not touch this again for a little while. <laughs> Cause I, I think I really, really 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 like this queen tea in terms of the way it overlays with the let me just quickly bring up the actual statue of queen tea it's almost like for like and nothing's forced and those of you who are kind of members of the channel will know that i kind of really do abhor forcing anything when it comes to my reconstructions 
I'm not a fan of changing features. I'm not a fan of exaggerating features. Um, I believe the artwork that the ancient Kemetics did was so good, was so accurate, um, and was so detailed that actually, if we respect it, we could come, we can know exactly what they look like. I think one of the reasons why art in Kemet is questioned is because it's African, and we as Africans need to see that, we need to understand. One of the reasons they like to question the accuracy of Egyptian or Kemetic artists is because they don't like what they're seeing. So what we need to do is we need to amplify what they're seeing. And that's essentially what we're doing with these, you know, with these reconstructions. Thank you. Sankum has just donated again another fiver. I really do appreciate you. He said, I do get discouraged by the anti-black narratives about Egypt. So I thank you for restoring my faith. I'm sure if Egyptians were green, you'd say so. Thank you. And I, and I like to think that I would because I don't think there's any benefit in falsifying history. So, you know, thank you very much for that, Sankam. I actually really appreciate that comment. Um, I wish I could pin it. Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. I, I, want, I want to pin it, but I haven't quite figured out how to do that yet. I think I need to download some software, but thank you for that. I appreciate it so much and I appreciate your donation. So anyway, that's the new Queen T. Um, I feel like it's got a little bit more wisdom, a bit more age to it. Um, I've given it a little bit more pronunciation. People probably wouldn't have noticed that. It's really subtle changes. It doesn't look madly different from the, the first one that I said looks a bit too young. And obviously the, the eyes have this kind of glassy expression, which now I feel that adds a little bit of age. because That's something that kind of comes of age. Your, your eyes do kind of get a glassiness to them. So I'm... You know, it's just it's just little subtle things, but something just felt right about that reconstruction. So that's Queen T. Anyway, today's not about Queen T. And then the final one, obviously, that I showed you was Sahure, which was obviously based on the only statue of Sahure we have, which is this one. And this one was a really, I'll be honest with you, was a really straightforward reconstruction. Um, so I don't need to tell you too much kind of about the process. There wasn't really that much that was difficult to do. Here's my reconstruction overlaid with the statue. So you can see once again, no exaggeration of the features. Everything's kind of like straight down the line. And then here's a half and half. So there's a half and half for you. And then finally, here's the reconstruction itself. So this one was really, just really straightforward. If I'm gonna be totally frank with you, it wasn't difficult to do. It's his statue tells you enough about what he looked like. It just looked, you know, obviously, his statue is obviously very African in its appearance, but um, I feel like the features, the complexion, everything just fell <laughs> into place with this one where I didn't have to do too much. Often there's a lot of kind of like to and fro and back and forth and with features and changing things and swapping things out. This one wasn't the case. This one I think was really just enough for me. So I was quite happy with this. Now, that is enough of a preface. And I think we're about, yeah, about 20 minutes in. So that's definitely enough of a preface. I want to get into what you guys are probably all here for at the moment. And that is the reconstruction of Amos Nefertari. So I kind of join me. I'm going to try my best to take you on a, a bit of a journey now because there, there really is quite a lot for us to take in here. Um, strap in, okay, and join me on this journey. Now, when I first mentioned at the start of this stream that this is a process I started 12 years ago, it's because there's a, a beautiful statue of Amos Nefertari that, like many of the works of Amos Nefertari, um, had been sabotaged. So it's probably one that you're very familiar with. I'm just going to pull it up now. Now, one of the reasons why this statue of Amos Nefertari really caught my eye and really caught my attention was because it's probably the only naturalistic work, you know, like truly naturalistic work that I could find of her. They've got other ones that are kind of, they're obviously lovely bits of work, but with the 
ancient Egyptian artwork and I did the same thing with Nefertiti. I did the same thing with my reconstruction of Akhenaten. Often you have to hunt, but you will find they have naturalistic portraits. Ones that it's just kind of like, look, we're trying to just nail the way this person looked as much as possible. And I felt that this one was really naturalistic. Now, the face, as you can see, had been kind of like half chiseled away. But I felt that I could redeem it. I've, and I've always felt that. And this is going back several years now, just to kind of paint a picture. I actually do own another, um, I own a group on Facebook about ancient Kemet. I'm not going to give the name because then it will just kind of give away too much. <laughs> they don't like connecting dots to making it too easy for people to connect dots. But um, it has about 50,000 members. And I started this group years back, way back in 2007, 2008. And one of the first things I wanted to do was restore this statue. You know, it's a beautiful statue. And I thought, actually, if you look at it, if you, and you know, obviously, most ancient Kemetic art is almost very much symmetrical, even the naturalistic portraits, even if they're not entirely there, symmetrical enough in that the human face is basically symmetrical. So, and a lot of the damage was restricted to one side. So I thought, oh, well, I can, I can go through the process of restoring this. And that'll be kind of really interesting process. Now, I'm going to come back to that. I'm just going to go really quickly. In terms of Queen Amos Nefertari herself, one of the things about her is that she's one of the, she's an 18th dynasty ruler. Um, she's the wife of Amos or the great wife of Amos, I should say. I, I do typify great wife because often great wife did not mean you know um marital or sexual wife a lot of people don't know but ancient Kemet was actually a matrilineal society so the um the bloodline and the royalty for want of a better word sorry I'm losing my words today was passed through the females passed through the queen so it was the queen's children that inherited the right to the throne, not the Pharaoh's sons. So this is why oft times you had sibling couples, but you'd have great wife and king, but not necessarily marital, as in, you know, having sexual relations, man and wife. Now, this is something that's understated because obviously there is a, a, a real kind of penchant for selling the ancient Egyptian society as an incestuous, you know, inbred one. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so when it comes to Queen Amos Nefertari, she's always been regarded as black. Now, obviously, we know from this channel that not all Kemetic kings and queens are regarded as black. Although, obviously, we we kind of like on this on this channel, we kind of accept the fact that ancient Egypt, Egypt was an African society. Therefore, it's perfectly plausible to, you know, to assume that a majority of the royal members and a majority of the society were the same as other Africans. Um, that's not obviously being totally exclusive. There probably were occasions of people, foreigners, being able to not only become part of the society, but also potentially ascend the throne because, let's be honest, it's within African nature to be welcoming. It's never been within African nature to be exclusivist and to say, we're going to close our doors. If foreigners were to come and they were to come peacefully, any African society would open them, we know, with, we know, we'd greet them with open arms. So we have to obviously bear in mind that there might have been, you know, elements, but the, the core of the society was an African society. But Queen Amos Nefertari was always regarded and always accepted, even by historians, as being black, racist historians as well. So I just want to kind of um, show you some quotes just to, Oh, can I rotate this? Yeah, I can. This is, I just want to show you some quotes just to kind of paint the picture for you in terms of where she sits in terms of comedic history. So it says here, a number of Egyptologists and historians have taken note of Amos Nefertari's black complexion. At the 18th dynasty, writes Samuel Birch, the negress mounts the throne. Look at the way they talk about it. <laughs> this is, you could always hear the angst at the fact that they have to accept that a black woman was queen, even though most of the, well, I would say all of the queens were definitely, you know, black Africans. But this is one that they feel like they can't deny. 
Wallinson observes that Amos Nefertari is represented in the monuments with pleasing fissures, oh, sorry, pleasing features, but a complexion of ebon, ebony maybe, ebon blackness. Osborne speaks of the Queen as being an Ethiop, Ethiopic or Ethiopian in complexion and descent. Dubois has stated that this queen with a black skin has been regarded as a negress. Negress, my God, that word. <laughs> Imagine if someone called your sister a negress. Clap City, oh my gosh. Um, and Mespero has noted that Amos Nefertari is generally painted black. So there was kind of this acceptance that, you know, if she was painted black, then she must have been black. Therefore, we have to accept her as black, which kind of is a, a bit bizarre because then you have Nefertari Meritmut, who is painted in the same color as Hathor, painted gold, but she was Nubian. It's, she's a known Nubian. So Nefertari Meritmut, wife of um, Ramesses II, was actually a known Nubian. But because she's not painted with black paint, she's clearly not accepted as being black. In fact, she's one of the ones that they use in this, as an example of being like modern Arabs. So it's, it's really, it's really interesting the way it all kind of, the way it all kind of plays in. But anyway, now that I've kind of painted that picture for you, I just want to take you through a few of the portraits of Nefertari so we kind of can get the picture of what, what it was these people were seeing. So here's a few of the portraits of Nefertari. This is probably one of the fairer or lighter skinned ones, I should say. Most of them are very dark. Now, there is the argument that can be made that the darkness of her skin is a reflection of her divinity. But then the difficulty comes in that she's depicted with Amos, her husband, a lot, and they they are siblings. Um, so, why would she be more divine than he is? What's the, what would be the situation there? Now, being someone from a black family, I can tell you that this kind of complexion slash phenotypic difference between siblings is totally normal. So please, people of Africa, can we just, you know, can we just share with the world how normal it is for siblings to come out, one to be light skinned, one to be dark skinned? want to be medium tone okay it's just my wife has a very dark skinned sister who's my complexion or slightly darker my wife is very much medium brown tone this kind of complexion and then her older sister is borderline yellow <laughs> all same parents just african phenotypic diversity so you know i think it was just a naturalistic depiction of her complexion here are some more portraits of Amos Nefertari we've got the three here okay now I want you to kind of take note of something because this is going to come into play a bit later but I want you to kind of take note of the shape of her nose because this is going to be one of the key things that I use in terms of reconstructing Amos Nefertari um, this is a beautiful statuette of her once again and then that one, I think I've shown you already. And then this is a bas relief, but even this one, I want you to just kind of take a note of the shape of her face, because we are really going to capture that as part of our reconstruction process. Okay, um, guys, hit the likes up if you haven't already. I'd really, really appreciate it. Some of you have obviously noticed the braids. Don't worry, none of this is going to be lost. I'm telling you, you're going to love this reconstruction. Okay, so... Now I'm going to go back to where I was before, which was here. So I was showing you the statue that I've always wanted to reconstruct so much. Okay, so it's been, it's been within my sights. I'm going to reconstruct this statue. So I'm going to take you through the process of how I did this. So the first thing I did was just to kind of show you, first of all, I'm very fortunate or we're very fortunate that we have this photo because we have a photo that is evenly lit from above where the light is dead center. So it allows us to take from one side of the face and to clone onto the other. So the first thing I did was did a bit of handiwork and I just restored the chin. So I just, that gap or that gash that was in the chin, you see there, okay, I just restored it, okay. It wasn't a hard process, it was relatively easy. 
Then I did the same with the cheek. So you can see there's a big gap in the cheek there. I used a bit of cloning from one side to the other and I was able to restore the cheek. So now we've got the shape of the face. And once again, that's been easy enough to do. Most of that was given to us. You could probably guess what I did next, given that process. The next step was to the nose. So as you can see in the previous photo, we can see the nose here. We've only got half of it. The next half has been chiseled off, but we can assume that the nose is another part of the face that's going to be relatively symmetrical. So I restored the other side of the nose as much as was present. And that gave me the exact width of what her nose would be. At least that's where the, that's the extent of the base of her nostrils now revealed to me. Okay. The next step in this process was to restore the lips using the same process. So once again, just cloned the left side of the lips over to the right. And although we haven't quite got the center point and we haven't quite got the shape there, what we have got is a really good idea about the broadness and the breadth of her lips. Now I want to point something out when it comes to her lips, because this is actually really important. I hope I don't geek out too much and kind of lose you with this. Please, please be with me a bit. Just bear with me. I want to show you something. I just want to show you this image really quickly. Now, the reason I'm showing you this image is obviously the same statue from this side is I want you to show you the protrusion of her lips. OK, the way her lips are very full, but they're not just flat. They don't sit beneath her nose. They actually her nose. They actually protrude further ahead of it. OK, she has very, very full, particularly top lip. So she has a top lip that has a, you know, it has a fullness to it, has a real kind of body to it. So this was one of the things I knew that I couldn't lose. I didn't want to miss this when I was doing the reconstruction. OK, I had to make sure that I captured that as well. OK, so that's one of the things that I just want you to kind of bear that in mind as we're going through this step process. So when it came to the lips, this obviously is just the clone version, but it's not the finished version. I knew that I had to preserve. You kind of see where the light is up here. I had to preserve the fact that they protruded out from her face. Now, the next step was to do the lips. So this was the reconstructed lips. And you can see all I've done is given a bit of shape to the lips. I haven't really touched the bottom lip that much just to kind of show the lips. And once again, I've preserved that kind of protrusion that the lips have. So the fullness is there and the protrusion is there. Fantastic. So people are still with me. I hope I'm not losing anyone at the moment. And then finally, the last step was the nose. Now the nose, before I show you the nose, I want to kind of show you how I got to the nose. Now, one of the things obviously that I could do, and you know that I wouldn't do it from obviously from habit, is I could just kind of get a random nose and just stick it on there. You know, we can see she has a broad nose. If we were just trying to do a bit of, you know, feel good <laughs> reconstruction, we'd just kind of stick on any African nose on there and be kind of happy. Well, that's what she looked like. But I, once again, given credit to the ancient Khmer artisans, I see a consistency. So it's similar to when I did my reconstruction of Nama and I used um, his, I used the um, Nama palette and the Stele artworks of Nama as a reference. I did the same thing with Joseph as well. I believe there's enough there for us to know what her nose looks like. So you can see her nose here. She has this kind of very long nose that has a slightly beaky end, okay? And I'm just gonna show you this as well from another statue, just to show you that actually this is consistent across a couple of different pieces. Bear with me, just trying to find it. So thanks for bearing with me guys. I'm just trying to find another image. Here we go. So I'm just gonna show you this other image as well. I think I've shown you this already. You can see this isn't accidental. This nose is there, okay? And you can see it's consistent, okay? Across the artworks. This one's kind of chopped off so we can't see it, but we definitely have this kind of like beakish kind of nose. And straight away, you know what my kind of mindset is. I'm straight, I'm straight away thinking to myself, where have I seen a nose before? And it's gonna sound really random, but 
it's like almost like the ancestors gave it to me, but I was like Burundi. That's a Burundi nose. It's really weird. I spend so much time now just kind of absorbing kind of phenotypes from different areas of the globe that I start to now really see these traits. Um, Stephen Carter, thank you so much for your $20. I appreciate it so much. Um, it goes a long way. <laughs> um, thank you so much, man. And you said, thank you, my dear brother. Thank you. And I'm saying thank you back to you. Um, I appreciate your support. Please do share and stay. Hit the like button. Um, so I said to myself, that's a Burundi nose. So what do I mean when I say it's Burundi nose? Let me give you a bit of a couple of references. So obviously, I'm not saying everybody from Burundi has this nose. <laughs> but I'm going to show you a couple of examples. So this is a Burundi woman. And someone just said, what made you think of there? I'm going to say just familiarity. If you look at this woman's nose, this is exactly what I'm seeing there. Now, why am I seeing this? Because if you look at the statue, although we have that beaky shape, whoops, have I lost? Oh God, I've lost my... This is so annoying where we... Uh, bear with me. Oh, I was doing that annoying thing. Sorry. There it is, sorry. Thank you. So we also have this width to consider. So I know that I'm gonna be dealing with kind of a nose that has where the where the nose connects. So where the nose connects over here with the face, I know that's going to drop lower than the nostrils. This is kind of me really geeking out here in terms of how the nose should look. But I know that middle part is gonna drop lower and the nostrils are gonna be higher. But now I've also got this relatively wide nose to deal with. So that's what made me think, I've seen that nose before, it's a Burundi nose. <laughs> I know it sounds really random, but I'm gonna obviously um, qualify this. I'm not saying only people from Burundi have this nose, but this is another woman from Burundi, and this is a really good example of the nose. So you can see it there. So this is what I was talking about. It starts right here in the middle, comes down, has a kind of beaky quality to it, and the bottom part comes down further than the nostrils, but the nostrils are obviously relatively wide. Um, another person from Burundi that actually has this nose, bizarrely enough, is the First Lady. So here's an image of the First Lady of Burundi. And this is probably the most perfect example of that nose that I'm talking about. So this is what I mean when I say she has a Burundi nose. This is what I'm seeing in those statues and those artworks. And this, I knew straight away, was the nose that I needed to reproduce. This is also the kind of nose from a profile view that will give you what we were looking at, which was, I can't do that thing anymore. Let me just quickly try and find that Stelle, bear with me. This is also the kind of nose from a profile view that will give you that kind of look. So this is why I said to myself, I have to honor and find that nose. So anyway, going back to my reconstruction, I'll show you where I ended up with her nose. If we get there, there it is, sorry. So where I ended up with her nose was here. So this is the nose that I ended up with. And when I completed this statue, I really did feel vindication. I don't know if that's resonating right now, but I saw this and I was like, that's her. That is, that is Amos Nefertari. That is what I'm seeing in the other statues. This is the same sister. It felt, everything about it felt right. The full lips, the Burundi nose, I'm going to call it now. <laughs> Although it's probably not the best word. I can honor, I can really thank you so much, my brother. Uh, great research work. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. I'm, I'm really glad that you appreciate it. Please do share it. Um, now, bear in mind, like I said to you, um, not all, you know, people from Burundi obviously have this nose. It's just something that I had seen there. And once again, it probably is an ancestral thing where it just came to my head, it was so random. By the way, in terms of Burundi, Burundi is along the Nile Valley, okay? Um, and actually, if you wanna ever dive into a society that has the full range of ancient Egyptian phenotypes, have a look at the Burundi society, you will be really shocked. You can kind of find most of the ancient Egyptian phenotypes um, on full display in Burundi. But yes, this face here was where I landed. And I was like, okay, I've restored the statue now. 
and everything within me feels right. I've honored the exact width for the nose that I was given. I've honored the shape of the nose as given by the other statues. I've honored the size and the shape of the lips. I can't really, I, I mean, looking at that, you could kind of, to some degree, see why they probably knocked off the nose and the lips. Because <laughs> that is obviously a very beautiful African woman and they ain't trying to push ancient Kemet as an African society. But hey, there you go. Um, now, finishing this work, I wanted to get a reconstruction going. I was like, well, I've got enough information now to do a reconstruction. And so this is what I'm going to unveil to you now. Um, thank you, Michael, for the $5. I appreciate it. So keep it up. I will do as long as I got you guys supporting me the way you do. Really, really appreciate it. Simon says you did it. Appreciate that, Simon, as well. Guys, I'm really glad that you're appreciating this process. I wasn't sure if I was, this is going to be a bit long-winded, but one of the reasons I posted this live stream so soon after completing this work was because I kind of just wanted to show it to you guys. I was so excited. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really glad that you, you seem to be engaging with it really well. Um, now, I'm going to show you the work or at least the reconstruction that I did. Now, I can't show you the reconstruction bit by bit. <laughs> Those of you, I think it was, I can't remember who said it. Someone said they like the music that comes in when I used to do the reconstruction videos that we kind of missed that with the live stream. We probably could get it if I get a stream deck, but um, we kind of missed that. But I'm going to show you where I got to with the reconstruction. So let me just, I've got a few different versions of it. So let me just bear with me. I'm trying to find the right one. So I'm going to first of all show you, in fact, the overlay. So this was this one might look a little bit bizarre, but I'm going to show you the overlay. And the overlay is 50-50 of the statue versus my reconstruction. So you can kind of see where I'm going with it. So here's my overlay, my 50-50 overlay. Okay. So you can see there, this is not obviously the final reconstruction by itself, but you can see how I've kind of preserved the features as much as possible okay and you can see where I'm going with this actually on this note I'm glad I quickly showed you this first of all I want to draw your attention actually going back to the um this to the broadness of the shoulders as well another thing that we maybe miss out on sometimes is that the broadness of African shoulders is very much an African feature yeah, we have, particularly African women, have much broader shoulders than their European and Asian counterparts. It's an African feature. It's one of the reasons why African people have a longer arm span. It's not because we necessarily have longer arms. It's because we have a um, we have broader shoulders. And the broader shoulders added to our arm span mean that we end up having sometimes almost 10% longer arm span than our European counterparts. Now, the ancient Egyptian statues, I mean, I can go back through Amos Nefertari statue, but this one in particular, look at the broadness of the shoulders. OK, this is very African. So when I did my overlay, which I just showed you, which. Sorry, it's not showing me the thumbnails anymore. It's really annoying. Where's it gone? OK, you know, I'm just going to close all these windows because it's going to confuse me. <laughs> Let me start again. When I did my reconstruction, which the overlay one, which I'm going to show you now. There. OK, when I did this overlay, I just did this to show you that it came to mind because I wanted to preserve the broadness of the shoulders when I did this reconstruction. I didn't want to lose that. Um, the Ghost Tiger 144. Thank you so much. Um, you said, even though they oppressed our Hebrew ancestors, good job. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I'm not totally up to speed um with that whole end of things but i appreciate the donation and yeah i appreciate you tuning in um i don't know what a p t t m h means i know i'm a bit lame for not knowing that i've seen that a few times so i'm like what the heck does that mean i don't know what it means tell me what it means someone in the, in the, in the comments <laughs> but anyway now that i've shown you the overlay i'm going to show you the final reconstruction because let's just let's just get into it i've kind of like beaten around the bush enough and i've kept you holding on so let me show you the final reconstruction of amos nefertari 
So this is my final reconstruction of Amos Nefertari. You can see, obviously, I had to carry through the braids, the thick braids. And it's like, one of the things that, it's like, how do you explain the thick braids, you know, or, or the thick dreadlocks if you're not of African descent? This is such a standard African phenotype. And, Af and she, you know, she portrays this in every single statue. You saw I haven't exaggerated the thickness because I overlaid them. This is the exact thickness of the, the braids in her statue. So I've preserved that. And I want you to see that Burundi nose that I was telling you about. Something that is so common in Africa. And something that I was really glad to be able to capture in this reconstruction. And obviously the lips, particularly that top lip. I needed to, to get the fullness of that top lip as it was displayed on the statue. So I was really, really pleased with this look. This, I'm not sure phenotypically where you'd where you'd place. Maybe maybe it is within Burundi, but the chocolate dark skin is well. Obviously, I've gone for because this is Amos Nefertari, and that was her most common complexion that we see. But I was, yeah, I was really pleased. Now I would say my only. I'm not gonna even say it's a criticism. Once again, going on the kind of idea that you know melanated skin does preserve very well um she looks quite young and i would say she looks like she's about 19 but then she could be i've got i have i'm not just boasting about this i've got relatives nieces that are like 30 who look exactly like this because obviously you know you look after yourself your age quite well so i don't know she does look a little bit youngish but I wasn't really willing. I could have gone in, I could have aged it, but I was like, mm, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't know why. There was just something about the entire um, reconstruction that I really liked. And I just kind of like, once I made it, I was like, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it. I love the way it looks. I love the way it overlays with the original. You can see, once again, I show you these overlays. One of the reasons I show the overlays is to show people there's no exaggeration going on when I create my reconstructions i don't do that everything i do literally almost one-to-one -one, pretty much as as close as possible and what they end up looking like is what they i believe they look like obviously the complexion is a choice but i would say it's a fair choice given the information and i would say given the early historians agree with me there's not really much argument here in terms of how she looked i'm going to show you some other kind of versions of this because i did a few versions of this reconstruction one of the versions is here and this version i did without the braids just so you could kind of appreciate her look in its fullness so i kind of I, I tried to do the feathered crown by the way i'll show you another one where i've done the feathered crown but i really couldn't capture it it's such a beautiful crown and i it, i mean i could capture it but it will take me ages to build that from scratch so <laughs> i've got this kind of like halfway house that i did but i want to show this one where the braids aren't dominating her face so you can actually see what she looks like as an african woman and yeah i'm just yeah i just i really i'm in love with this reconstruction i think one of the reasons i like this one so much as well is because once again just the process that it took to get here it, it would have been impossible to make this reconstruction with just the ex existing statues of amos nefertari and it would have been impossible to make it with the statue um, that's been sabotaged, the naturalized statue that's been sabotaged. But the fact that I had to do the process of restoring the statue, utilizing the old artwork to get the feature set correct, and then using that to build my reconstruction, I almost feel like I've given her a face back. I don't know. I, I, it could be, I could be on one, but I really, really am taken with that. Let's um show you a couple more versions. So I did mention that I have a, a version with the crown. Let me just show you that. So this is the, the full version with the feathered crown. So it's the hair and the feathered crown. I, I could It's supposed to run all the way down there and it's supposed to kind of have a, a you, you can see it's missing some features. But I, I did this just to kind of like give an idea of what that kind of feathered crown headrest might have looked like. I know it's not spawn, <laughs> you don't have to tell me, but it kind of gives an idea of, you know, what, you know, 
the Kemetic royalty may have looked like in the time. Um, I am going to do a lot of work actually working on things like the crowns and headdresses because people have pointed out to me before, obviously I do my reconstruction. Sometimes I have like metal crowns, this, that and the other. But actually as I've, as my research increases and obviously learn different things, we know that the crowns from at least some of the eyewitness testimonies were made out of felt. Um, I've spoken about the fact that the crowns conformed to the shape of the hair. So even with Amos Nefertari, just once again, going back to her statue that we were looking at originally. Let me just sorry, bring up the full statue. Going back to her statue that we were looking at originally, the crown conforms to the hair. So the hair only comes out towards the bottom. But if you look at all of her, statu all of her statues, you can see the hair there coming out the bottom of the crown. Once again, here as well, the hair coming out the bottom of the crown. And I think just going back to the reconstruction that I've made, one of the reasons I liked it so much is because now I can see, I can see her when the artist made this, even though this is a miniature statue and it was in like a, you know, a big life-size bust, enough of her feature set is there that I was like, oh, I really like this. So, um, I think, I mean, I would like to get some feedback from you guys. I think some people have said uh, she looks East African. Cool. Um, could I talk a bit louder? Sorry, I'm seeing that late. I, I can fire. <laughs> it's a bit late for me to start talking now. I've just seen that now. I didn't realise I was talking quietly. I, I'm, I'm a bit closer to the mic now and I hope that helps a bit. Um see uh yeah you're essentials are crying right now yeah well yeah i think they've been crying a long time if they're tuned into this channel i've actually got those of you who don't know i've actually got whole channels dedicated to debunking me that's how <laughs> that's how much i seem to annoy <laughs> people um you know people who have a eurocentric disposition um whole channels where it's just my videos being debunked it's interesting um, <laughs> that's hilarious um, obviously I'm not going to give those people any of my time or energy or give them kind of any of my you know give anyone any idea who or where these people are because they're just simply not worth the time but yeah it's really interesting to know but I think in terms of me unveiling the reconstruction that's kind of it if there's anything you want to see or want me to kind of discuss put it in the comments now I think I'll stay on for the next 10 minutes or so. We could kind of talk through any of the reconstructions that I've shown you um, before, yeah, before we kind of pack it up. But I said it was going to be a shorter live stream. I think I've covered what I wanted to cover. I actually thought it was going to be take a bit longer than that. So I'm happy that we managed to get to, yeah, to get where we are now. Um, but yeah, I'd love to like, hear from you guys. Most of you say you really like it. Um, I'm just looking through the comments. Sh Shaman, Shamani, Shama, sorry, Shamanic Journey <laughs> says, I've seen a Somalian that looks like this. Maybe, I didn't, you know what? When I created this, I, I didn't even see a Somalian. Um, but now that you mention it, I can see, yeah, I can kind of see that. I can kind of see that. I Once again, I, I guess my, my eye was fixed on this area of Burundi since that I borrowed the nose from there. But yeah, I can see that. Um, Truth Seeker says, your attentiveness to detail is amazing. We appreciate your efforts. Oh, I appreciate your feedback. Um, in fact, now that we've done that, let me just quickly switch screens because we can re-engage now. Yeah, so that's it. I'm, I'm reading off my screen here, by the way. So when I go kind of quiet, it's because I'm reading the comments on my big screen. Um, almost 9 p.m. in the UK. I say it's almost 10 p.m. in the UK. Almost 10 p.m. in the UK, Mr. Tibbs, if you're wondering. Um, Somali, not Somalian. Yes, thank you for correcting me. Did I say that? I actually knew that, so I should have, <laughs> should have said that. There you go. Um, just found your channel. Reconstructions are stunning. You made a video about the 
destruction. Sorry, that's, that's a question. Have you made a video about the destruction of noses and such? I think I'd like to. I think I'd like to, because I think that's an important topic that we have to, we have to have. And I think actually one of the topics or one of the um, sources we could use to begin that discussion is the Sphinx itself. We had the discussion about the Sphinx at the start of this video, Horror Mac here, and we could see the state it was in, you know, in the, in the late 18th century. It was, you know, there was a lot more of it there than there is now. And the reason is because the destruction has been ongoing. I mentioned to you that I had a friend whose grandfather was in the military and said they used to play target practice on the face, on the nose and the lips of the Sphinx. They were given free reign to do that. Um, and these, these are British British soldiers, soldiers by the way. Um, and he said that without any shame. He wasn't like, oh, I feel really bad about it. He's like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know. So the lack of respect for ancient comedic Artwork for ancient comic antiquity for African antiquity has kept up from the late 18th century right to the early 20th century and maybe even up until today. It's probably being taken over somewhat by the um, those of Arab disposition um, who are in Egypt at the moment who don't like the Africanicity and who really feel no shame to hide it. Um, I was doing some research actually on the temple of Nefertari Meritmut. Um, I encourage you to do some research on this because the temple of Nefertari Meritmut, they found it, they closed it for several years doing restorations and they reopened it and the temple looks like it was painted yesterday. The brightest one, and obviously everybody in that, there's not a single African licking stele on the wall. Everything looks kind of like tan <laughs> a tan complexion and the the features all look very un-african and then they try to really sell the claim oh we haven't touched it everything is all we've done is glued the artworks who are which were peeling off the wall we haven't done anything it's like was i born yesterday have a look at the the, the temple of nefertari maritma it has been totally vandalized and those of you who've been on this channel for a little while know what I mean when I say vandalized. I mean it in the literal sense of the word, i.e. the vandals have defaced it. So, yeah, have a look at that. So it would be very, very interesting to do a documentary or do something along those lines. Jada Pinkett Smith should have forgotten about Queen Cleopatra. She would have been more on more solid ground by representing one of these queens. Absolutely. Absolutely. All of ancient Kemet's famous queens are, it's very hard to deny their Africanicity from Hatshepsut to Queen Amos Nefertari. The, obviously the Nubian queens, the wives of uh, Menzohotep being Queen Kawit, Queen Kemsit, um, Ashayet. So many great queens through Kemetic history where it's so much easier to basically make the argument about their Africanicity than obviously the Ptolemaic era, which wasn't even a, a comedic era. Um, I'm not, by the way, throwing mud at Jada Pinkett Smith. I don't know the woman. I don't know what her motivations were. I'm sure they were pure. So, you know, I'm not going to disrespect her whatsoever. But obviously just um, because it was on a fuzzy talking point, which has kind of shaky foundations, it's kind of just given the, you know, modern racist Egyptian, not all of them, not all of them are like that, by the way, many of them are not. Um, but those in Egypt who have that loud voice and who have a problem with the Africans, um, it's just given them some some ground to stand on um, and to shout their nonsense, which is, you know, not my, not my favourite thing to admit in the world. It's really annoying, actually. Um, I'm big on Amenhotep III. He's, um, yep, we've got a lot of artwork of him. Um, he's on my list. I think my, the reason I haven't rushed to Amenhotep III is because I guess to some degree, like Amos Nefertari, he's one of those ones where for a long time, early historians accepted his Africanicity, accepted his blackness. So doing a reconstruction I know will be easy. I think I'm a glutton for punishment. So I go for these ones that are a little bit more difficult <laughs> i don't know what's wrong with me but yeah um a guy with long black hair that looks like 
Rasputin Metatron spreads a lot of Eurocentric nonsense about ancient Kemi, yeah, on his channel. Yeah, he does. He's just a closet R word, if I'm going to be totally honest with you. Um, he tries to hide it, but he seems to only have a problem with Africans, you know, exploring ancient Egypt. He has no problem with Europeans doing it. He has, so he thinks it's more his civilization as someone on the Mediterranean because he's Greek of Greek descent and because it borders, not even borders, there's a, because there's a sea separating Egypt and Greece. He feels like it's his, one of his civilizations that he can claim and he can, you know, take a look at the Africans who actually built ancient Kemet and look down at them. Um, but I don't give him any energy. Um, I have responded to him, actually. So if you have a look on the channel, I've got a video responding to him and another geneticist. Um, enjoy looking at that. That was, that was a live stream as well. I don't want to be slapped by Will. <laughs> Very funny lawyer. Um, I'm looking for a question, to, to, or maybe not a question, a statement that I can build on. I've already talked about Cleopatra, so I'm not going to go into that too much. There's a video on that as well. Can you make videos on how modern Egyptians are Arabs genetically? I won't make a video about how they're Arabs genetically, but I will make a video about the anthropological origins of the modern Egyptian. And actually, I believe they are more Greek than Arab. I've mentioned this many times. I believe they, there's a large amount of Greek ancestry um, in modern in modern Egypt. I think there's a large amount of Greek ancestry. I think, obviously, there is definitely Arab contribution. I think the most recent one is the... And I think, actually, ironically, I think the Arab contribution is actually the least of concern on a genetic or an ethnic level because actually i think going back a few a few hundred years ago you'd find that you couldn't tell arabs and africans apart and i say that with all seriousness the middle east used to be full of dark-skinned africans they used to call them sand n-words i'm sure you remember hearing that okay there was a reason for this so the middle east was essentially the place we call the middle east the arabian peninsula was essentially an extension of Africa and it was filled with African people. The people that are there now that a lot of people think are connected to the ancient people are actually of Turkic and Syrian ancestry. Okay, um, A lot of that expansion happened during the Ottoman expansion and also the Mamluk, the Mamluk um, upheavals that took place in that region. And that's when the people of kind of Turkic origin took over. And that started from, I think, around 1400 AD onwards. But before then, the Arabs that probably originally settled in ancient Kemet probably would have been of very little phenotypic difference um, to the Africans that were already there. So it's very interesting. Um, so, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's very interesting. Do you believe in the Green Sahara? Yes, I think there's ample evidence for that. And I believe that ancient Kemet is a nilo saharan civilization. So obviously I speak a lot about the Nile Valley we don't speak much about the Green Sahara or the Saharan contribution, which would have brought in, you know, your modern day kind of Chadic, Niger, um, even Libyan, Wolof, Senegalese, etc., etc. All of those phenotypes would have been brought in via the Sahara. So, yeah, I do believe it's a Nilo Saharan civilization so it's a, a result naptoplaya also kind of somewhat proves this so it's a result of culmination of african genius in that part and i actually believe after the sahara dried up you had people leave the that basin that kind of green sahara basin and people or you know move into west africa move into east africa so they kind of spread from there so i think a lot of the shared origins doesn't necessarily come from Kemet itself. Some of the shared origins comes from the Green Sahara, the civilization that existed there prior to ancient Kemet being established. Um, but that's a whole extra conversation. But that's at least where my kind of um, studies have led me to. The Shunaman study in its failed attempts to claim modern Egyptians were indigenous accidentally confirmed the modern Egyptians, Greek origins, spot on. I agree with you 100% fire. I don't know how to say your name. I want to say firefly, but I'm sure it's not that. <laughs> um, I agree with you 100%. And I mentioned that actually in my documentary um, about the subject, about the Suneman study. Um, yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. 
Um, let's go for a few more and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, Coisin phenotype you see in reconstruction might be from them living in East Africa prior to Bantu expansion. Um, yes, I think that comes from the, if, I, if I'm going to go, if I'm going to believe what the ancient Kemet, can might say about themselves and that they 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 originate at the top of the Nile and obviously expanding on the you know the my kind of research into the Nama palette that leads me to believe that the Nama palette actually depicts their origins at the the foothills of the Nile or at least the you know the, the top of the Nile I should say if I'm going to believe that then I'm going to have to believe that there was a culmination of these phenotypes particularly the Southern African phenotypes um, that played a part, particularly in early um, ancient Kemet. So yeah, that's that's definitely what my kind of thought process is. And this is one of the reasons Kemet is very phenotypically, was a very phenotypically rich society, which is why I do not mind picking from pretty much any corner <laughs> of Africa to build my reconstructions. Why would I do this? Why don't I not just pick from literally right next to it? Why don't I do that? Because ancient Kemet, like I mentioned before, was made up of 40 or 42 gnomes, depending on the time period you're looking at. And each of these gnomes, Kemet was no different to modern African societies. Go to any modern African nation, Nigeria, Ghana, wherever it is, you'll never see one single ethnicity, one single monolithic ethnicity. Not African ethnicities are never that small. African ethnic Af African nations, sorry, African ethnicities never really grow massively. We don't grow big monolithic ethnicities. What happens is they splinter and they form smaller ethnicities. So if you go to a nation like Nigeria, you find hundreds of ethnicities. Now think of each of these ethnicities as gnomes or spats in ancient Kemet. And that's what you're looking at when you look at the 40 gnomes. You're not looking at people that were the same. I've got a video about the Dendarans, for instance. For instance. So if you haven't looked at my video about crocodiles, please check that one out. But my video about the Dendarans, um, and I didn't touch on this, speaks about the fact that they were phenotypically distinct. When um, Pliny and um, Strabo spoke about the Dendarans, or the people of Tentry Tail, whatever you want to call them, they said they were a, sh a small people. So they were actually a pygmy people. They were there, right there. Their spat is right there in the middle of Kemet, lower in, in upper Egypt, obviously, upper Kemet. In the middle of upper Kemet, you know, not too far from Luxor. There it is. They're, they're these group of ancient Egyptians, but they're short in stature. They're essentially pygmy people in ancient, in ancient Kemet. This idea of a monolithic ancient Kemetic race is false. And that's one of the things we have to kind of dispel. They weren't one race. So when I say the ancient Kemites were black, I'm not saying they were black and they look like this. And so many people are so obsessed with finding a single ethnicity that's going to reflect ancient Kemet. I don't believe that's the case. I believe depending on which, where the leadership come, came from, which is why you have huge amounts of phenotype differentiation between whether or not the ruler was Theban or the ruler was Memphite or the ruler was Hierapolitan, <laughs> depending on wh where they ruled from. They looked massively different from perhaps the ruling family or the ruling dynasty that came before. The Sayite and the Tanite rulers that came in the later periods, which were obviously still ancient Kemetic, but they were right on the border of Lower Kemet, right at that kind of like Mediterranean kind of end. They looked completely different, or at least they probably looked very different from the rulers that ruled from Thebes. So we have to lose this idea of a single monolithic kind of identity and understand the way African nation states work. African nation states, or, and, and you have to look at ancient Kemet as a nation state. African nation states work on multiple ethnicities existing under kind of one leadership. And this is why the, each of the spats or the gnomes had different deities, had different practices, different beliefs, etc., etc., because they were essentially different ethnicities. But that's one of the things that yeah, I think is lost where people try to... The reason Europeans are so obsessed 
with monolithizing, if that's a word, or, you know, applying a monolithic kind of nature to ancient Kemet. The reason Europeans are so obsessed with that is because Europeans essentially come from monoliths because they are very narrow genetic and very narrow phenotypic um, subset of humanity. So one small nation that all speaks the same language and all look the same, yeah, can spread quite broadly, you know, you know, to a European, a Spanish is a Spaniard and they speak Spanish and they look like this. To an to to a talk to an African to ask them what a Nigerian is. What does a Nigerian look like? They'll laugh at you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because Nigerians look so different. You could be Fulani, you know, you could be Yoruba, you could be Igbo, you know, you could be Tarewa, you could be so many different things. You could be um Irobo. You know, there's so many different ethnicities and they look completely different. They act completely different. They talk completely different, but they exist under a single nation state. And so it's really important to understand this is what you would have been dealing with in Kemet. You would have been dealing with different phenotypes, different looks. So there's, and this is why I feel like over the, and bear in mind, look at the course of time we're dealing with as well. We're dealing with a, a civilization that existed for at least two and a half thousand years at a bare minimum, probably much longer. How much change do you think took place over that time? Okay. People would have left. People would have come in. There would have been widespread migrations in and out of Africa constantly. So that's to be taken into account. Firefly, not to digress, but do you know whether any of the flooded archaeological sites under Lake Nassau are recoverable? That is a project I would like to do. I think that's one of the most important things that I think the African Union and we as Africans should get behind is restoring the lost antiquities of Lake Nassau. And actually, Lake Nassau is not unique. I'm going to reveal to you that I... Here's a bit of a sea piracy theory, okay? So I'm not going to talk about this too much. But the tactic of flooding is something that was used globally by the same people that flooded Lake Nassau. I'm just going to put that there. So I would encourage you to look into hydroelectric dams because they've put them everywhere. We have them in Nigeria. And my gut feeling, and I could be wrong about this, is that a lot of Benin's antiquities and perhaps even some of the great city itself sit under lakes. I was looking at Lake Kalinji. I could be wrong with that. Don't quote me on that. I've got the research somewhere. But I was looking at different lakes that I believe hide antiquities. They're in America as well. Lots of different lakes, man-made lakes, where they would just flood. People of African, African-Americans who are on this channel right now, you will know what I'm talking about because you'll know that different lakes and parks were set up to flood whole black townships and whole black cities um, in America. So I'm not going to go too much out because a bit of the sea spiracy, but yes, I, I think that some of them are recoverable and that would be a good piece of work to do. And thank you so much for the donation, by the way. <laughs> um, let's give it another, I'm enjoying this, let's give it another five minutes and we'll, we'll call it a day. Um, another s uh, simple logical thing about Kemet, a civilization so amazing, so wonderful to have to pass throughout Africa and attract the whole of Africa. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for your hard work. Uh, you're welcome. We need your genius family. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. Um, good body, Haru. Um, Roman Empire spanned many countries. Yes, but was unified in Rome, so Kemet could have been an African version of Rome. Yes, so one of the things I was going to point on there is well, even the ancient societies, so even if you look at Greece, Greece wasn't a monolith. A lot of what we see and we classify as being Greek, ancient Greek society was actually Macedonian. And actually the Macedonians were even Greeks. They were kind of people who bought into Greek culture and were thus accepted as a kind of Greek add-on. But the Macedonians weren't the same as the ancient Greeks, the Spartans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These were all different. And we're talking about different ethnicities here. So once again, just going back to that point, they really do try and f force this idea of monolithic race theory. They all looked like this. They all spoke like this. They all rubbish. It doesn't apply. It certainly doesn't apply in any African kingdom. It doesn't apply whatsoever. 
Okay. Ähm. It happened in the US. Entire black communities were flooded by lakes and parks. Central Park. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. I don't want to go too much into that. Cause I don't want this uh, live stream to get struck out. I want it to get shared. So hit the likes up, by the way, if you haven't done that already. Um, your amazing life like reconstructions give me such a sense of pride in my ancestors. Defacing the noses of the African um, aristocracy shows their hatred and jealousy meant to hide our beauty and talent. Absolutely. You have to remember the time that they found ancient Kemet in as well. It was so important to sustain a lie. <laughs> because they were using it to build themselves economically. So the timing was was everything. Um, it was a bit sad because if they had found, maybe just stumbled across ancient Kemet now, you know, um, Nubia and the Nubian artifacts might still be with us. They wouldn't be sitting under a lake because maybe it would be a bit harder in today's day and age to do such an atrocious thing um, as to flood an entire community. Um, I've actually got Nubian friends um, and one of the things I've actually promised to do, and I do really want to do it properly, is a documentary on modern Nubians, the ancient Nubian society, but also the modern Nubians who were displaced as a result of Lake Nassar. But it's such a big and kind of arduous and project that I have to be so careful with and I have to tread so carefully that I need help with it. I've reached out to a few of my Nubian friends to kind of like help me to do this project correctly because I want to make sure that I really do obviously honour the existing Nubian community that is there who, you know, I had a friend re reach out to me and actually say that they, they used to still use the temple of Ramesses when they moved it from Abu, moved it from Abu Simba or moved it to, I can't remember where they moved it from or when they moved it but when just before they flooded the lake, the Nubians used to still go in there because it used to have perfect alignment and they used to celebrate Ramesses' birthday on a certain day. And now it doesn't align anymore. It doesn't The sun doesn't quite fall in the right place because they've moved it. Heartbreaking, you know, for, to have a people disconnected from the culture that they created. And that was very deliberate. Disconnecting Nubia from their, you know, from their antiquities was one of the reasons they were able to, you know, sell this lie effectively of ancient Kemet not being an African society because the existence of Nubia and Nubian antiquities is the smoking gun. It ends, ends everything. That's it. That's the, the end of the discussion. We know these people were African, you know, and they were the same as their neighbours to the south, but they don't, you know, that that's, that's what they do, you know. Modern Nubians are the best people in Egypt, humble, beautiful. Well, the ones I've met are ace and I do need to go to Egypt some some point very very soon do you know if any of the flooded archaeological sites under Lake Nassau oh, no, I've already read that so what am I doing um, Bantu expansion never existed well this is something I want to get into Eve as well that one of the most overused words in African <laughs> um, in African kind of anthropology is the word Bantu and I, I think people don't understand what it means they just think that Bantu is a type of black <laughs> It's unbelievable. And I've even heard people of the African diaspora using it incorrectly. You know, I've been, oh, yeah, you're African, you're Nigerians, you know, you're Bantu. It's like, no, we're not. <laughs> and not, not that there's anything wrong with Bantu. Bantus, from what I, from my research, they are the closest um, culturally to ancient Kemet that I found. There's so much kind of coherence between southeastern you know and southern african bantus you know people like the who are referenced so much people like the nguni um people of south africa the san they're so culturally close to ancient kemet it's unbelievable and actually when the tests were done the, the autosomal dna test it's no coincidence they came up as the closest living relatives to the 18th dynasty okay the closest living relatives them and the great and those in the great lakes regions closest living relatives Closer than even the modern, um, even the modern Nubians. So, you know, this is this is what the autosomal DNA test said when they were carried out on the 18th dynasty. So I've got all respect for the Bantu, but it doesn't mean that you can just go throw around that word incorrectly because <laughs> most of Nigeria isn't Bantu. Okay, Bantu is more of a south western to south and to southern to south eastern um, link language group. Um, and I could say kind of like, it's not really ethnicity, it's more of a, a cultural 
expansion than anything. Um, but a lot of the other kind of language families, and I don't like quoting these because they weren't even really set up by us. You know, people talk, oh, we could talk about, you know, Nilo-Saharan, um, Afro-Asiatic, uh, Niger Kordofan, or Niger Kordofan, I should say, um, Bantu. We could talk about the different kind of language groups that are set up, but I think that whole um, classification needs to be revised because especially with like, I've spoken about the fact that, you know, Igbo people can translate, you know, Hebrew phrases that Hebrew, you know, he, people who call themselves Hebrew now, Yiddish people cannot translate um, using their language. So it, it brings a massive claim towards the whole idea of, you know, the um, Israel expanding into West Africa. And there's lots of kind of like literary evidence to suggest that that's the case, that West Africa was full of Israelites at a time. And this was accepted by Europe, um, that this was the case. So where does this leave the language families? Because Igbo is, I don't even think Igbo is classified as an Afro-Asiatic language family. Where where would it leave that? Because then that would suggest that it is Afro-Asiatic um, because it would have been a descendant of proto sinaitics somehow. So this is just some of the, um, yeah, some of the things that need to be discussed <laughs> in terms of, yeah, people throwing around terms and not, not perhaps getting them right. The term Bantu itself, I'm not sure exactly. Someone said, what does it mean? Um, I know it's made, made up of two terms, bar being an ontological term, a kemetic ontological term, and into meaning people. I think bar means something to do with the soul or the afterlife. So could translate people of the afterlife. I'm not sure, but um, I'm that I'm sure people could feel feel free to correct me on that. Um, but bar is definitely an ontological term from ancient Kemet. Um, and I'm not sure who actually designated the people with that term as well. I'm I'm, I'm totally unsure, to be totally honest with you. Um, how did they build the Great Pyramids without sunscreen? <laughs> Eating fish, very good. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, I mean, it's logic, isn't it? Actually, one of the funniest things I ever saw was a uh, US centrist saying that the brownie red was, that's, that's, that's the colour, that's, that's just the colour Europeans get when they stay out in the sun for too long. <laughs> I had to laugh because I was like, oh, well, you just believe that all of ancient Kemet was filled with melan people who had, you know, onset of mild melanoma and they all died. Unfortunately, there's just no evidence of ancient Kemetic people dying of skin cancer. So false. Yeah, try again. Um, I always wondered if the ancient Egyptians were truly a modern, were truly the modern day Egyptians. Why can't any of them speak the native tongue of their ancestors? Because they were not their ancestors. Yeah, put quite simply, because Greek oh, Greek culture overtook, um, and you know, they they were Greek and they wanted to speak the Greek language. They created Coptic as a bridging language to be able to translate ancient Kemetic works and they ceased to speak the language because they weren't them, as you said. You know, they were they were Greeks. Um a lot of that expansion took place out of Alexandria and the Fayum and over time um there was no one left to speak the language because all of the people were either diffused into the population I would say a small amount would have would, would have been diffused into the population um, or they fled south. And th that's it, really. Um, there was a long period of time when after ancient Kemet fell, that Nubia obviously retained its sovereignty and repelled attacks from Greece, Rome, even um Islamic invasion. I think Nubia only finally fell, or Meroe, I should say, it was Meroe then, not called Nubia, only fell, I think, in 1400 AD. So we're talking about, you know, a millennia and a half, <laughs> a millennia and a half, fathom that amount of time, 1500 years after Kemet fell, Meroe kept their 
sovereignty. Okay, this is understated. What's really understated is how long Nubia, when people look at Nubia like it's some secondary, secondary civilization and it's not worth discussing. This is the longest standing level civilization in global history because it stood for longer than Kemet did. If you go from 1400 and trace back to, you know, conservatively speaking, let's say, I mean, the ancient Kemet people say they came from Nubia or came from the Nubians, but let's go by Western historical books and say 3000 BC, four and a half millennia. There's nothing that even comes near close to comparing to that. So, you know, it's just worth, I think, I think they stood for 10,000 years, by the way, as well, but I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into that. Um, Monday. If I skip over comments, it's because I can't read them all. So someone's mentioned about the Dogons, um, who basically are descendants of their well, descendants of part of the ancient Kemetic priestly lineage. Um, I can't say which spat, but once again, I look at things from that perspective. They, the Dogon people being a single kind of monolithic people would have come from a single spat and a priestly cast of that spat because of the knowledge that they hold. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, I'd love to do some more research. I've actually got three large scranton books he's a bit on this kind of like a little bit on this kind of they got help from the aliens or somewhere down the line stuffing a bit of alien theology into there because you know what these are <laughs> you know what these europeans are like it had to come from aliens but it's interesting because he does tie together quite effectively actually um dogon belief systems and comedic belief systems and how they meet quite nicely so i will give them some time and i will read them um I'm going to call it a day now, guys. Um, please do hit up the like button. I really, really appreciate you all, especially those um, that submitted um, or who gave donation. Well, not especially, but I have to give a special shout out. <laughs> I, I, like, <laughs> I appreciate everyone equally, but I have to give a really special shout out to those of you who have donated. You've done a massive and amazing thing. Thank you for joining me. I have thoroughly enjoyed sharing this reconstruction with you. I'm just going to quickly go full full screen again on, where are we? Where's my mouse? Here it is. I'm going to go full screen again on my reconstruction of Amos Nefertari. I have to say, once again, this is one of my favourite. And once again, this community is what makes it really easy for me to build these kind of reconstructions and to get your feedback. Um, I appreciate you all. Please do continue to tune in to the King's Monologue. Um, hit me up on the comments. Hit up the likes. Hit me up on the comments when the live stream ends because obviously the chat disappears. So if you've made a comment on the chat and I haven't responded, feel free to post it again in the comments. I am very much more likely to respond to the comments once I get through them um, rather than responding to each of the chats, which is really difficult. Thank you so much, family. I'm going to tune off now and go and see my family. <laughs> um, have a fantastic evening all. And I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>